Oh, fuck! I left the TV on! So basically, this footage is just one long chase scene. I gotta stop rewatching my old reviews. Oh! Cliffhangers on! It's an attack! Welcome back to the B-Movie Rollout. Today is part two of our retrospective of the 1936 Republic Pictures film serial, Undersea Kingdom. In part one, we covered chapters one through six, which follows our hero Crash Corrigan on an undersea adventure to the lost city of Atlantis. After establishing that Crash is a big-time sports baller, he joins a reporter and this little monstrosity on a mad scientist's rocket sub into the depths of the ocean. Upon arriving, they find Atlantis under assault by the evil Unga Khan, who also wants to take his doomsday devices to the surface and conquer Earth once Atlantis falls. We're meant to be sympathetic to Atlantis, but that city is run by a theocratic dictator who has his people salute like this in the 1930s, and also utilizes gladiator matches to determine innocence or guilt. Meanwhile, the bad guys have these and this, both of which are the coolest things I've ever seen. Kinda hard to cheer for the good guys in this one. Also, the Atlanteans put Crash in charge of their army after like one day because he survives the gladiator match, which he was put in because he killed an Atlantean. Again, these are the good guys. We last left off on one of the series' many cliffhangers. Crash was escaping Khan's fortress via tightrope while missiles were being fired at him. That's the end of Corrigan. I don't think you'll need any more context than that, so let's dive right back in. Here's chapters 7 through 12 of 1936's Undersea Kingdom. Roll it! We're nearly across, Billy! Pull up tight! Trouble from Corrigan. I'm gonna jump! Billy! Billy! I can go alright, Crash. Let me down. You sure? Take it easy now. Crash and Little Billy here make their way back to Atlantis under hot pursuit. Once they arrive, they are reminded that Billy's father is still under the mind control of Unga Khan and is designing a rocket that will take Khan to the surface. They realize Professor Norton will need materials stored away on their submarine, so they leave again to go get it first. But not before doing that salute again. God, he's not even kneeling this time. Crash and Billy arrive first and start gathering the materials, but Khan's troops are not far behind, arriving just as Crash resubmerges the submarine. He swims away with some explosive powder on a makeshift raft, but one of Khan's archers hits it with an arrow, which detonates it. Okay, unless he was shooting those explosive tipped arrows from Rambo First Blood Part 2, I'm not buying this. Check it out, the explosion doesn't even damage the raft. Chapter 8 opens by replaying the closing scene we just watched, but adds a one second clip of Crash swimming away, so we see he survives. That's the end of Crash Corrigan. Not like all those other times we saw him die. He's definitely dead now. I'll be the new star of the last chapters. Actually, that might not have been a bad idea. That commander is played by Lon Chaney Jr., a much better actor than our hero. Crash sends Billy back to Atlantis with the remaining powder, but Khan reveals a new aerial weapon. Uh, 
Again, coolest thing I've ever seen. It's at this point we realize how batshit insane Crash is. While Billy runs back to the city, Crash decides to take on Unga Khan's fortress himself, completely unarmed and wearing nothing but short shorts and a rooster helmet. It's Crash Corrigan! He's escaped the explosion! Fucking duh! The wooden raft escaped the explosion. Crash finds his way into a tunnel that will lead him to Khan's fortress, but he has to bend some steel bars to get through. Crash arrives at the fortress and finds the brainwashed Professor Norton. He destroys some of Norton's work and takes on, like, five of Khan's men at once, but Norton knocks him out cold. Khan is Crash strapped to the Juggernaut and orders them to ram the gates of Atlantis. I don't know about you, but the dialogue and facial expressions of Crash and Lon Chaney Jr. here just crack me up. Go ahead and ram. I love that. Oh, Did you change your mind? No. Ram the gate! Okay, please note the smoke and crashing sound. Now here's the opening to chapter 9. Go ahead and ram. Ram the gate! happened last week? Have you all got amnesia? They just cheated us! This isn't fair! Although severely outnumbered, Lon Chaney Jr.'s character, Captain Hacker, takes a page from Crash's book and decides he's tough enough to take on the city himself. from Sharon, and warning that if you're not back in five minutes, I'll blast everybody in this court! Get back there! Unfortunately for him, Billy sneaks into the Juggernaut and frees Crash, so Crash catches Hacker off guard. In order to infiltrate Khan's lair and rescue Billy's father, Hacker is taken back to the fortress by Crash and Billy. Not someone from the army, but Billy. I'd scoff, but Billy's proven he's quite handy with that ray gun. Crash goes to rescue Norton, but first he has to go mano a robo with one of the Volkites. I know it didn't, but it's kind of fun to think this scene might have inspired Die Hard. Crash and Billy take Norton to the top floor of the tower so they can escape in one of those sky chariots from earlier. They get out, but Khan fires a missile at them, which is a direct hit. So they totally die! <laughs> That's their finish! Like, twice! So how do they scam their way out of this one? There, finish. Get Cardigan out of the way. Nothing can now interfere with my plans to take this tower to the surface of the ocean. Gee, you died just in time. Oh. I hope your dad so they hurt. just survived the crash. Okay. Khan sends his men to capture them, but Crash overtakes a chariot and they make a rush for Atlantis. Since his men failed to catch them, Khan orders a full scale siege on Atlantis. Unga Khan's army is about to lay siege to the city. My son, upon your shoulders lies the safety of Atlantis. Zigail! The battle scene is pretty fun. While it's obvious that the guys are fighting with wooden swords, it's always fun to see the juggernaut in action. During the chaos of the battle, Professor Norton slips out and makes a run back to Unga Khan, as he's still under the effects of Khan's mind control. Khan then orders Atlantis to be bombed. Prepare the great projector. Crash attempts to rescue Billy and the others who are hiding in the temple, 
So this episode's cliffhanger makes it appear that they are buried in the rubble from the bombing. But of course, the opening of the next episode shows that they survived. Except for the High Priest Sherrod, apparently. I am surprised they killed him off. Meanwhile, with the city destroyed and Norton back in Khan's custody, the so-called Black Robes retreat to the tower. Norton tells Khan he needs more equipment from his sub, so Khan sends him along with Hacker and the Volkites to acquire it. Naturally, Crash is on his way to the sub as well. Hacker spots him, so he sets a trap in the sub by somehow getting the clumsy, lumbering Volkites into it first. Crash smuggles his way aboard and dispatches with the unstoppable killing machines in, like, a second. Crash and another soldier then disguise themselves in the Volkite's armor and break into Khan's fortress. He then orders Khan to reverse Norton's brainwashing. It works, so Crash and the others then go down to destroy Norton's rocket motors. But Hacker begins the launching process, so the engine room is set ablaze, giving us our most intense cliffhanger yet. Our final episode opens with the last goddamn cheap cop-out this series can come up with. And it is a lame one. Check it out. Oh my God! I can't make it! Oh, a trapdoor. Sure, why not? I guess that other guy doesn't make it, though. Anyway, Khan's tower launches and begins its way to the upper world, breaking through the protective shell between Atlantis and the ocean above presumably extinguishing all life left in Atlantis below. Holy shit! This lighthearted adventure serial just got a lot darker. But don't worry, Billy and Diana escape a watery grave by taking Norton's rocket sub up after the tower. Oh, good. Khan's tower surfaces and he prepares his attack, but Crash breaks into his control room and just kicks his ass. Crash also manages to get a warning out to the Navy, who believe him because, well, people would believe anything in the 1930s. So the Navy launches an attack and destroys the tower, but Crash and Norton escape in one of Khan's planes. We then get our all-too-perfect conclusion, which I really think you should just watch for yourself. Once I discover the secret of Anger Khan's control, all mankind will be relieved of the drudgery of physical labor. Well, that's all very fine, Professor, but right now you're coming with us. Where to? We'll need you as a witness at the Marriage License Bureau. Splendid! Oh, fuck this series. Yeah, they're getting married, no one will ever have to work again, and Billy's a little rascal. Boy, hey, look out! You might hurt me! <laughs> It's both. It's alive. Got all that? God, the 1930s were a simpler time. <laughs> Can I come along too? So I imagine you're wondering what my whole point was. I mean, why review this? Well, I have a great appreciation for the cinema of bygone eras, and I figure many of you do as well. But every so often I try to step out of my 80s comfort zone to see what inspired the stuff I love. As much as I bitch about how all we get are remakes these days, some of my all-time favorites are remakes themselves, and others are damn close. Everything samples something, so I think it's fun to occasionally go back and check out the roots. In this case, the film connection is Star Wars, which is a series I know many of you feel very strongly about. As I rewatched this, I saw numerous themes and tropes that would also appear in the original Star Wars trilogy. From the names of the episodes, to the intimidating but ineffective foot soldiers, to the mobile fortress that also includes a doomsday weapon. I mean, Khan's henchman here has a control panel on his chest, just like Darth Vader. Plus, the Volkites look badass, but they get outwitted by everyone, and are even used by the heroes in disguise. Kinda like Han and Chewie with the ATSD in Return of the Jedi. So if you like Star Wars and have even a passing interest in what cinema was in the 1930s, I would give this a shot. Just so long as you remember the context. Don't forget this whole production was filmed in less than a month and acting in the 1930s was very different than what it is today. And of course by different, I mean worse. 
with the exception of Lon Chaney Jr., who, as some of you may know, was one of the greatest actors to come out of that era. He has a supporting role in this production, and it's a real treat to see him just a few years before he became one of the timeless icons of the Universal Monster Horror films. Go ahead and ram. So that's about it for me. Our next episode will be the finale for both this season and, unfortunately, the B-movie rollout itself. So I'd just like to say thank you for tuning in all these years I've been doing this. This show wouldn't have lasted nearly as long if not for all of you. We'll see you next time. He didn't get out of the cock a duty car! They always cheated like that in um, chapter plays. That's the story. What kind of strange crap is that?